The Waco History Podcast is sponsored by Brotherwell Brewery on Historic Bridge Street in Waco. Cross the Brazos in Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos in Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio All right, welcome back to the Waco History Podcast. We've got a colleague and friend on today uh, who I wanted to have on for a while and he agreed to come on. Uh, Dr. Bracy Hill is his name. He's a colleague in the history department, and he could talk about all sorts of different types of history uh, from the old world to the new world. And there's a lot of things that Bracey could talk about. Uh, he's an award-winning author of numerous uh, articles. His book, which I want to go ahead and mention uh, to make sure that we get that out there, God and Nimrod in the World, is a Mercer University Press book that's made quite a splash. And uh, it is uh, offers Christian perspectives on sport hunting, and that is the topic that I brought him in to talk about today. Uh, he's taught a history of hunting course uh, at Baylor for years. It's something he's thought a lot about. He's a historian and a hunter, and so he's going to help us think a little bit about the history of hunting. Maybe not in the proper, not in Waco proper, but in the Waco region, Central Texas region. So, Bracy, thanks for coming on the Waco History Podcast. Thanks for having me. So we, I was talking about this, an episode we're going to re- release later on about just trying to get an idea, you know, early on if if we could transport ourselves. And and we're in the mid-19th century when, you know, Waco's kind of established, you know, to get a sense of kind of the game that was in this area or historically if you've run across descriptions of game or or what, what might have that hunting landscape look like early on well there was there was a a plethora of wild game in the area uh, most notably bison were just north of this area toward mineral wells and then of course up the great plains there were wild turkeys rio grand turkeys that mm-hmm. were present uh, there were many white-tailed deer in the area and a little bit to the west of us there were also antelope and all of these animals would be preyed upon by you know recent arriving uh, folks already from the early, even before the Republic, so mm-hmm. and, and went at the time of Mexico, and then, of course, into the early Republic, and then after it entered as a state. So Waco was right on the edge. Uh, and it was also, as, as we move into the latter part of the 19th century, also a hub for a lot of the market hunters. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we think about Texas and market hunting, and we think of waterfowl, we think of canvas back, and, and um, geese that would be taken along the coast, and toward Corpus Christi or East Bay, Galveston, and all those kind of places. But there was a lot of market hunting that went on right here in this region. And in particular, it was white-tailed deer and bison. And those hides were taken, not so much the meat, but the hides would be taken out. There'd be contracts, and literally tens of thousands of hides would go out at times out of one year out of Waco to be transported. So what we had were turkeys, uh, and they were they were apparently in great number because Mm -hmm. I've come across accounts from the 1850s and 1860s where you're looking at people going out and coming back from a hunting trip, a couple of guys going out and they'd come back with dozens of white tailed deer, so many bison, just all the pins, bison were hit or miss. Well, quite literally, but, (laughs) but they would come back with more than a hundred turkeys. Um, and I just got the reading an account of a young man who was not far from here when he was, his family established themselves in the 1820s. And one of the first animals he killed, besides rabbit and squirrels, was a turkey. And it was, other than the black bear he killed later on, which were present. Yeah, he was he was impressed because when he carried his first turkey out, the turkey was dragging on the ground behind him. So yeah, we had all kinds of wildlife besides raccoons and small game. Uh, quail were prevalent in mm-hmm. the area, and that would be something that would be an issue. Prairie chickens, as they also would eventually, because of loss of habitat become a concern for conservationists or sometimes called protectionists of the era of the late 1890s uh, and 1880s. So we had uh, migrating waterfowl come through the area. And remember, there's no no lakes in the area. Nothing's mm-hmm. natural. It's just ponds at best that might have been dammed up creeks. So you don't have a lot of waterfowl setting down. They're mostly on the coast uh, from the flyways that are coming through. But most of it's mammals, 
Mm-hmm. We've got birds in the sense of what might be called upland game birds that are in the area. And, um, yeah, it was it was a hunter's paradise. I mean, Louisiana does not have a – and they may still have a hold on it, but Texas had it and still maintains it to a degree because of the number of wildlife that we have in such a large state uh, and the opportunities that are present. Well, one of the things you said in there that I think is interesting, I think I know what you mean, but when you say Waco is right on the edge – Right. Yeah, talk a little bit about that from this perspective. Well, you know, the Spanish and then the Mexicans afterwards established themselves along basically a, a line of missions and garrisons, the kind of the mission, the, the Presidio kind of pattern that extended up from the Rio Grande along probably something most people are familiar with around here is OSR, right, Old San Antonio Road mm-hmm. um, uh, or the Camino Real. So you had this passageway but it was, it was dangerous because of ever-present indigenous peoples, mm-hmm. most notably the Comanches. Um, people didn't like the Apaches necessarily, but the Comanches were a large group, and they were, they were greatly feared. There were many other indigenous peoples in the north, many of them having been forced westward from the United States as we move into like the 1830s, the Cherokee here in the north, the Kiowa, the Wichita. Um, but it was the Comanches in particular that were – feared greatly. And this was the border area. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you move westward toward Bosque and Erath County and Hamilton, that was that was Indian territory of sorts, but with a small T, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was also where the bison were as well, and they would drift southward. Uh, not in the massive herds, although I've read accounts where it was just the, the describe like the horizon was dark uh, with bison. But they they were they were round. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. So this was a place where you have some establishments. Um, you have towns that begin to pop up. Obviously in the 1840s, where there's water, you got a river and the like, mm-hmm. um, and the farming communities. But it was still on the edge, mm-hmm. and it was. I mean, symbolically, you would look out and you would see your cattle mixing with bison. Yeah, I which mean, is they, crazy. Which is a yeah. visual mix, and that you could tell that bison there because apparently the cows would start making noise. So in that way, you literally were on the edge of, of, uh, of a cultural shift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, on the edge of ecosystems as well, you know, you've, got, you've got forest one direction, kind of a forested uh, area one direction, you have rangeland exactly. kind, of, kind of the other direction. And so it, it would seem that Waco would be a place that would have a mix of species that could be Kind of like an estuary, yeah, where you kind of have a mix of species from those two different kind of ecosystems. It's true, mm-hmm. and if you look, of course, at, at uh, we're on that Blackland Prairie mm-hmm. kind of section. It's, it's you know it's got some clay, some heavy clay, and and the Blackland referred to the soil itself. But it's just it, it is uniquely uh, located geographically, as you say, uh, and uh, and naturally, of course, then we have different types of critters that that are roaming mm-hmm. around. Um, of course, you know, bison, you know, the, the story of bison is going to be almost a quick one to extinction, you mm-hmm. know, in the, in this period, just after what we're talking about. And I've always been interested in, in, you know, how they're hunting bison at the time. I mean, I grew up deer hunting, yeah. you know, where you sit in the stand for four hours and you don't see anything and you go home, but you know, but you know, bison, it would seem like the equivalent of hunting cattle or some, I mean, I mean, what, what are the, what are the ways in which they're hunting bison in kind of this market period? Uh, well, first off, it's not easy. It depends upon the account. But yeah. there are more than a few accounts, particularly from the late 1860s and 1870s, where people are going out from Waco. Mm-hmm. And they're headed to places like just west of, uh, again, of Mineral Wells and northward. It's a little bit west of, of Fort Worth and then to the northwest of that. And they're, they're hitting the herds. And the herds are migrating occasionally down. But the herds are dwindling by this time. Mm-hmm. Um, after the Civil War, the United States Army took a intentional approach towards the Native Americans, and that was basically forced settlement and mm-hmm. putting them into reservations. And the first way to do that was to eliminate their life ways, and yeah. that meant their food ways. And so many times we think of the elimination of the bison. Of, you know, I remember as a young person hearing stories from Coach, my history teacher, you know, people <laughs> rolled up on railroads and they just shot them from the cars. Mm-hmm. And I guess that might have been true, but the first, in some occasions, the first killing of the bison were soldiers yeah. that were told to go out, yeah, kill some bison for food, but mostly just kill and leave them. Yeah. 
So by the time you get to the late 1860s, early 1870s, when we're definitely in the market period, you've got bison, and they, they're not stupid. They are wild animals. And many times, at least in this area, the way to get at bison was to find them as they were trying to approach water, mm-hmm. which meant, of course, streams. Yeah. Um, and if you could find where they, and you could do that simply by finding tracks initially, but then try and ambush them. But the stories are that they would come in and generally be led by uh, an older male. And the older male is, is uh, looking and catching in, in the, the wind and trying to catch the scent of any kind of threat. And then would finally let the herd in if it appeared to be safe. Most of the weapons that were used, it's interesting, I've read a couple of accounts. Most of the time we think of like the big sharps yeah. right, rifle, which was true. It was this big bore rifle. Uh, but early on, they were being hunted with muzzle-loading firearms. And I, I got, came across one account from the 1870s, which is fascinating, because the guy was saying, we didn't use rifles. We used smooth bore muzzle-loading weapons because it took too long to load your rifle. Mm. So what he said is we would literally, we wouldn't even use a ramrod. So we would load our rounds. And then we would, so you put your powder in, you drop your ball, you put a cap on uh, the firing cone, and you would shoot. Then you would carry a ball in your mouth. Now, I'm thinking, God, there's a little bit of lead, swallow, little yeah. lead poisoning going on here. <laughs> I remember as a kid sucking on sinkers, you know, when you're yeah, fishing, yeah. it tasted funny, and it probably is why I'm not as smart as it used to be. <laughs> but, you know, but they would, the, and he said the spit from your mouth on the ball, if you drop the ball down a smooth bore gun, would be sufficient that it would fall and stick to the powder down at the uh, in your charge, and you wouldn't because you carried your rifle barrel up. Uh-huh. The ball's gonna fall, hit your powder. You're gonna flip it down, pull, cock it, and uh, fire. And okay. so you didn't have to worry about um, you know having to distance your your charge taking off and then pushing it, basically creating a pipe bomb. So you could you could get two shots off and you get shots yeah. off faster. Okay, they use revolvers, uh, but what they soon learned is that placement was everything. And the accounts are, and you get these novices who many times tell their stories in the 1880s uh, for publication and the like. And they would talk about their first hunts out. One of them, for instance, he shot a big, big bull, and the, the bull went down but wasn't dead. And so he rolled up in front of it, and he thought to put it down. And he simply shot it between the horns and the skull. And he said the ball just flattened in that mat of hair right God. there. So they had to learn to shoot. Primarily, it seems like they shot just behind the front shoulder or okay. in through the shoulder. Okay. And this was a way of making a fairly quick kill. Now, what they frequently did is they snuck up on them. They tried to uh, get an ambush, generally at a water site. Um, and most of them didn't hunt on horseback, although there were some accounts of guides who were demonstrating their ability by riding down with a with a multiple chambered firearm, like a, a revolving rifle or a revolver, and firing into the herds and chasing them, much like the indigenous people did with bows and arrows. But most cases, it was ambush. The novices are out there to make money. Teddy Roosevelt tells about his brother coming down to the Brazos River. Teddy was too young to have experienced it. Mm -hmm. But coming down with a group of, let's call them entrepreneurs, (laughs) looking for an opportunity to make money. They had to get a wagon. They had to get a chug wagon. They had to get a, a cook. They had to have food. And it just turns from disaster to disaster. They end up with drunken fights with other, you know, other hunters. And it's just this a grand adventure. And that's what a, a lot of the market hunters were. Mm-hmm. And if they got lucky, they may get a couple hundred odds. Yeah. Um, and if they weren't, they might get five. And so it was not as easy as we frequently think of as – uh, the parties and you remember everything you kill, you got a skin. Yeah, somebody's got a skin. Yeah, um, and so there were. Of and course, these are huge animals, so massive. you get it on site. I mean, absolutely, where it fell is where you're skinning it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I would think you talk about position. I mean, if you're, you got to be pretty close to these animals. To you're not using a rifle. I mean, it seems like you got to get pretty close to this animal. You're going to hit it. Yeah. The writers of the time yeah. period would many times would speak with a kind of respect for the indigenous peoples who would ride on horseback and then fire into the bison with their bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, again, as one writer described, you know, he said it was this tiny little bow, as he described it, 30 inches or so, because it had to be small enough to be handled on horseback. And he went on to describe that actually they would somehow color code their arrows so that when the squaws came along mm-hmm. and did the butchering, 
They could identify who delivered the killing blow, and that man got, of course, uh, the respect, and the rest, of course, got a, you know, they didn't really quite do it. To a degree, the same thing was true then for these young American hunters uh, rolling into Texas, and they were looking for opportunities, and many of them knew how to use a firearm, but had never hunted something like this. Yeah. I mean, it's like me hunting a T-Rex, right? I'm not really sure how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, and they would have to figure it out. And many times with, you know, some embarrassment, but they gradually figured out placement was everything. Yeah. Shot placement was everything. And you're still talking about black powder, even with cartridges, black powder firearms. And they're del- it's not as much energy as we get, for instance, in today with our modern gunpowder uh, from much smaller bore, smaller cartridges. So, yeah, it was a lot about placement, sometimes multiple shots. They would describe novices shooting or amateurs shooting bison five, six, seven times, and them just standing there basically shaking it off. Now, clearly they weren't, but, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I mean, the, the good end of the story here is the recovery of the bison population in the 20th century. Right. I mean, have you, you've hunted a lot of stuff. Have you ever had a chance to? No, I've never, I've never hunted bison. I, yeah. uh, you know, the closest I've come to it is at one time I butchered an entire cow in the middle of a Texas field at night. <laughs> and and I, with coyotes crying out there just out of sight. And I thought, this is what it's like to, to kill and clean up. I didn't kill the cow. Uh, but I cleaned it was it. your cow. Though. It wasn't my. It was somebody else's cow that was. Down but they and, knew you were doing. Yeah, this. and they were like, "Hey, man, you want to come out and butcher a cow all by yourself?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Sure." So they roll out with the trucks and shine the lights to watch me butcher a cow. It was great. It was awesome. It was a good experience. And I realized how hard this was. Oh, and yeah. I had a guy working my knives, just sharpen them for me. Yeah. And I've got coolers and Yetis. I'm throwing all the pieces of meat into. And I thought, this is this has got to be an amazing. Yeah, it would have been scary. And I didn't have truck headlights, right, to yeah. help me out and how they would have had to have been responsible at least. Because what happened is at night, the wolves came in. Yeah, if you don't get it done by nightfall, yeah. it's gone. Wolves yeah. come in, and which led eventually to also opportunities to kill wolves. Mm-hmm. You see advertisements from Central Texas general stores for the arrival of crystal strychnine. Yeah. And we begin to see a clear kind of attack on on predators, particularly wolves. Let's talk about that. I mean, because I, I, I think, uh, you know, I do teach an environmental history class, and, you know, the great Satan of the animal kingdom is the wolf. Oh, yeah. As yeah. it's the perception of it. Uh, but talk a little bit about predators uh, kind of in this period. Well, yeah, the, it is ironic that the killing of the bison led to the prosperity of the wolf initially mm-hmm. because there's all this meat laying around. Yeah. When many of the market hunters killed bison, the chief thing was the removal of the hide. That was what would sell. Uh, they were green hides. They'd be taken off, just dried, so they're not they're not being processed there other than simply removed from the animal and dried out, with, and they would be like a stiff board. Uh, and is, then, is that because there wasn't much market for the meat, or it didn't preserve well, or... There were a couple of things. Salt. We, yeah. yeah. So first off, I mean, if you were to preserve it, it'd take a lot of salt. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the only type of meat that was really taken consistently from bison were their tongues. Okay. It was a large hunk of meat. It was manageable. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a market for it in the East. But we don't have refrigeration. Yeah. We don't have refrigerated cars yet. And if I, you know, the, it's the best to understand they had figured out a new method for tanning processing bison hides Mm -hmm. and this new chemical system led for a market for this this otherwise tough hide it could make it a leathery quality right exactly yeah yeah. so there's a demand but there wasn't so much of a demand for the meat nor was there an easy process for moving meat from the great plains to particularly the urban markets of the eastern cities Mm -hmm. and northeast northern cities until we get to refrigerated car and then everything changes that changes with all kinds of meat industry in america so there just wasn't that market. Now, did they eat the meat? They generally ate meat till they were literally sick of it. And that was all they ate. They hadn't had enough vegetables, and they began to suffer yeah. digestive-wise from that. Uh, and, of course, they'd be covered in, in fat from the bison, et cetera. So there was an immense amount of waste. It wasn't really then until years afterwards, uh, people who would arrive would describe the, the Great Plains. It looks as if it had snowed mm. from simply all the bones on, wow. on the Great Plains that had been left behind. But there was then gradual, you know, collection of the bones, generally by the poor. They would stack them up, mark them, as this is what they picked up. The trains would come through. 
They pick up the bones, and then those bones began to be processed primarily for fertilizer, mm-hmm. for being used in the creation of bone china, um, and a number of different devices that would be useful in the particularly the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. So there was a delay. Eventually, it gets recycled, but in the meantime, you see predators that benefited from it, but then those same predators are going to be seen as a threat to the animal that fills the bison spot in the ecological system, and that's that's the cattle yeah. that were moved in. And so you see the intentional elimination of uh, particularly a number of type of predators, the, the wolf, mm-hmm. then the mountain lion, mm-hmm. which was seen as a predator uh, for, again, large animals like, like uh, the cows. Um, the grizzly bear, as you move further west, we don't have to worry about that in Texas. We have black bears, although they were soon eliminated. Um, and, and then the coyote, mm-hmm. which is wily and survived it all, filled the niche left behind absent uh, by way of, of the wolf and continue to move eastward all the way to Long Island. Yeah. Uh, they're everywhere. That's remarkable. Yeah. yeah. As you're describing uh, bison kills, maybe think of that scene dancing with, dancing with wolves, you know, where they come over the ridge and see the aftermath of a market hunt uh, of bison. Yeah. Um, but, but that's really interesting. I, I thought in the middle there, we're in the cattle drive period, if there was some entrepreneur that got a wild hair to try to round up bison and get them to a railhead <laughs> to, to try to get them on the hoof back to, to market, uh, you know, if there'd been any taste for bison like there is now, uh, you know, I think one of them would have tried that. But the, well, you know, they yeah. did, they did round them up. Yeah. And, and I read an account actually of a young man who had killed a cow, which had a, a calf with it. And his bright idea was, I'm going to rope this sucker and I'm going to take it home. It was a, a sad story because the bison calf resisted so much that it killed itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are, however, going to be bison that get rounded up. And, for instance, by 1885, the bison are gone, except this guy named Goodnight, kind of famous, yeah. he gets a herd together. And the realization is if we don't get herds together and essentially almost treat them like cattle, we're going to lose them all. And it wasn't a conservation impulse so much as an economic impulse. Mm -hmm. There was money to be made here. And that's pretty much how we're going to see most of the bison that would be the basis for uh, the American Bison Society. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, he's there. But that as they try to build a herd in the northern portion of North America and the United States, uh, and they're going to utilize captured little herds uh, and use them as the breeding stock, to establish the the ranges in, of course, you know, Yellowstone area. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but it doesn't seem like they don't domesticate well. Yeah. Some animals just don't domesticate well. Yeah. And, and while we do see bison behind fences, the majority of them are today. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just, yeah. I, and as I know, my students always refer me to the picture of the YouTube of the guy riding the bison. I can't remember <laughs> it. I don't want to remember it. It's got a horrible song. It looks like it's from the 70s. But, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't a widespread solution to I, the no. bison issue. Um, you mentioned Teddy Roosevelt. It makes me think uh, a little later period, Boone and Crockett Club and his exploits in the Dakotas and you know this concern over sport hunting or this rising concern about game and sport hunting and uh, ensuring the presence of, of huntable game, healthy huntable game. And, and I'm wondering when... I mean, you know, teaching Texas history, teaching a history of hunting, when does that sort of sport hunting kind of consciousness kind of emerge in Texas as far as thinking about a game a little bit differently, not just survival? So uh, the emergence of sport hunting, generally is kind of, obviously it's a European thing, mm-hmm. but not surprisingly in the 1820s and 1830s, you at least some historians have argued that there is this uh, heroic image that is utilized as a kind of icon of freedom, of individualism, and that's the frontiers person. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that frontier keeps shifting further and further west, and that means everybody behind it is not that. But the ideal is there. So a way to participate in that ideal would be to, to hunt, although, of course, by this time, the populations of game have been decimated mm-hmm. by the westward movement. Uh, Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence, 
uh, wrote an essay about westward movement migrants uh, in western Pennsylvania. And as they moved through, and he described them as species, he's a doctor, but as species. (laughs) And the first one was people who showed up, they cut down trees, they built a a house of sorts, they built a a, a lean-to for their animals. And they basically, besides drinking spiritual liquors, as he described it, (laughs) (laughs) they basically worked a couple of days in a violent kind of way, and then they would just do nothing. Well, actually, they did what they enjoyed, and that was fish and hunt. Mm -hmm. And they essentially moved on after two or three years after the game was no longer around or was so afraid of them. Uh, and also neighbors started to show up and complain about their cows getting in the corn, et cetera, and they would move on. So the point is you have this decreasing population always behind the, the frontier movement. Mm. So by the 1820s, 1830s, we definitely had the movement towards sport hunting in America in general. And we began to see the influence, especially of British sports culture mm-hmm. coming to America. And you begin to see a number of, Let's call them journals, periodicals that focused on sports. That meant everything from dog racing, horse racing, racing, but also things like hunting Mm -hmm. and fishing. And there were these kind of, let's create a culture where we do things as sportsmen. There was an ethic that was involved that clearly was not there legally. As for limitations, increasing our skills, et cetera, there'd be marksmanship, live pigeon shoots, Mm -hmm. or is they right? And those kind of activities, many of which, by the way, are soon going to be in places like Waco, yeah. uh, where they had pigeon shoots. And so you have it already by the 1820s and 1830s. And I've come across articles in one of the one of the more popular of those sporting magazines called Spirit of the Times. And you look in the 1850s, and there are, and I quote, correspondents from Texas <laughs> that are writing and describing the amount of game that are present in Texas. And comparing it to anything, of course, in America and that can compare to anything in Europe. They're already, again, yes, come, we have great land and you can blah, 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 but come and hunt. Mm -hmm. And there's these stories uh, about, or I should say, uh, they're articles describing turkey hunting, describing hunting black bear of parties before the hunt, um, (laughs) where where they go and they hunt and it describes in a poem all the various things that they would hunt. But it was done with a kind of sport hunting. These were not people surviving off this meat. Mm -hmm. They were doing it with a culture, with cultural rules, cultural expectations, with rituals already there. Mm -hmm. There was the night party, dinner ahead of time. There was revelry. There was drinking of hard liquor and singing of hunting songs. And then the next morning, I guess after they drink a lot of coffee, (laughs) because Texans apparently did like a lot of coffee, they would then go about this, this kind of hunting, and many times hunting together. So we have sport hunting and it being espoused as a, comparison to anything else in the world by the 1850s. Okay. By the time we get to the 1890s, Waco itself becomes a hub for conservationists, Mm. for hunters who are concerned about the disappearance of wild game. Mm -hmm. And they begin to form um, groups advocating for laws and restrictions, particularly curtailing the hunting of market hunters, both for mammals but also for waterfowl. And there are going to be a number of organizations in 1890, 1891 that pop up here in Waco. Um, and then between here, Austin and San Antonio are going to be the centers for these protectionists that begin to advocate to the Texas legislature for limits on on hunting, whether it be seasons mm-hmm. or game. First, they basically get uh, game bags reduced. So, for instance, for, for ducks and doves, 25 birds a day. But no closed seasons. And then they push for closed seasons. And then they're going to push for enforcement of it, which mm-hmm. the Texas legislature will be slow to get to. But by the time we get to 1907, actually 1903, we have a general game law that begins to be passed. Um, and we have a formation of a commission that we begin to see that type of we're sport hunters, we have a culture, but we need to think about the future. Mm-hmm. And actually, Waco is one of the key places that's associated with it. Oh, really interesting. Um, so two questions, uh, you know, what you mentioned some of them, but you know, what, what species are they particularly concerned about? And then what are some steps they're taking to kind of ensure health of those species besides restrictions that you talked about? Right. So the first thing we see is by 1878, they're beginning to be these associations that form. Mm 
One of them is called the Texas State Sportsman Association. And, and a key fellow who's associated with this is a fellow by the name of Oscar Charles Gazez. And he will, he'll live from 1855 to 1925. So it's mm-hmm. this nice, beautiful span of Texas pre, obviously, Civil War, but then um, into the 20s, and a lot mm-hmm. of stuff is going on with Texas, you know, oil, et cetera. Um, he would serve in the military. Uh, he would serve in Cuba during uh, the Spanish-American War. He would be active as a, a journalist, as a correspondent for many of these um, early Texas sporting journals, magazines in the 1880s. But he would become an advocate for restrictions, particularly on game birds were an easy thing to focus on. Mm-hmm. White-tailed deer was the other thing. Mm-hmm. And Texas had obviously tens of thousands of white-tailed deer mm-hmm. when people began to settle, but they became a fairly fairly easy target of sorts. Um, and of course, white-tailed deer don't reproduce that quickly. Yeah, And so as a result of that, the numbers began to drop. So that was one thing. But Focusing on birds in particular and market hunting of birds was one of the things that these groups that began to pop up in the 1880s, many of them under his direction, would focus on. It was an easier way to create limits. So I could say you can only kill so many birds at so many times. Um, They began to push for limitations of seasons so that there would not be killing of birds during uh, breeding seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, add to that, they also focused on songbirds, which is interesting. So birds were a good place to start mm-hmm. because in 1892 the bull weevil rolls into Texas. Oh, yeah. So one of their one of their arguments was that hey, look, we we enjoy again sport hunting, gentlemanly. You walk through the field, you shoot the birds. You got a, a dog that, of course, is of a particular breed. So it was again this kind of gentleman kind of approach to the pursuit of animals and of course the acquisition of food, but with sport. Mm-hmm. But if you could argue to farmers that there needed to be robins in particular, so everybody liked to kill robins. I've never eaten robin. I've had friends who have. They say it's pretty tasty. Mm. But robins and doves and quail, that these birds very well might prey upon bull weevils. Uh. Wouldn't you want a limit on the taking of those animals? So birds were a great place to start. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And then in southern Texas, or coastal Texas, I should say, the, of course, the waterfowl were, um, that was a great export of Texas, is tens of thousands of ducks would be exported to markets for New York City or Chicago for nice urbanites to consume. The most expensive was the canvas back duck. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the most desired of them all. And so they were hunting them to, of course, near extinction. Now, the problem with, um, the advantage of the ducks and the waterfowl was you could bring the federal government in. I see. But one of the first things that these protective orga- organizations did in the 1890s was argue for the Texas legislature to, to articulate the ownership of wild game, not to the people, but to the state. Not to the landowner. Exactly. But it, it's got state jurisdiction. And it took them a while to get there, but yeah. that was the first step in them beginning to create regulations. And birds were a way of approaching that conservation ideal and to bring in more diverse kind of um, uh, allies in the fight. Now, there was big business mm-hmm. in exporting birds and exporting deer, and that had they struggled with it. And then people just didn't want to follow the rules, even some who supposedly were advocates for this conservation. Uh, so... Guess as is going to be important all the way up into the, the early 20th century. But there are a number of people, like for there was one organization, uh, Turner Erath Hubby of Waco was okay. a secretary. Uh, a guy named Walter Vincent Fort was a treasurer of an organization. So these are Waco, uh, important Waco persons, um, relevant to the conservation effort. Many of the meetings were done in Waco, at least initially, and then moved to Austin. Because among other things, there were some of the bird shoots here. And yeah. so they had the sportsmen here. And they would gather together. And they started to create these these um, these organizations agitating for legislative changes. Well, that's really interesting. I, we uh, On another episode, we talked about uh, Tory Trading Post, which mm. was near Waco. And I think there's about a nine-year period, 75,000 deer hides go through. Exactly. I mean, the volume of... Uh, so. 
what they're pushing back against is a big enterprise uh, in market hunting. I mean, the depletion of game, I guess, is, I mean, is becoming obvious by the end of the 19th century. Yes. Those old timers are, are talking about what they see then versus what they saw when they were young. And I'm sure it's noticeable game depletion by that point. By the time we get to World War II, 1941, there's a, there's a, a ban on killing turkeys. Because they're gone. Yeah. And already there had been a limitation on the bag limit. Um, by the 1930s, uh, the the Fish and Oyster, and by that time you had Fish and Game and Oyster Commission, which is now the, the conservation organization and, and policing organization, is bringing in deer for breeding because we don't have whitetail deer. Mm. Um, they had already passed laws in the first decade of the 20th century to limit the number of deer you could take. And in particular, they were focusing on bucks. Mm -hmm. I believe you could take four off the top of my head or five bucks per year. Mm -hmm. uh, so already, let's not kill does. That I think also was a kind of, it was a gendered sportsman kind of thing. But there was this realization that if you kill bucks, does still get to reproduce. But um, that's still a lot of animals. Yeah, And there was not a season. Mm -hmm. It was whenever. Oh, wow. So, um yeah, it, there was by the early early 20th century, there was not the wealth of, of fauna uh -huh. in the area. I mean, when we think of the modern kind of deer season that's been ingrained in our DNA. I mean, w when does that kind of take shape in, in how we would think about kind of a, a modern system of when you hunt and when you don't? We get that in the, the early, early, 19, uh, early 1900s. We have our first closed season on antelope and bighorn sheep in 1903. Okay. And that's also when the bag limit was set on white-tailed deer, for, and it's actually with six white-tailed bucks. Okay. And you had a, a basically a two-month season or other than after 1903. So 1903, 1906, there's going to be a renewal of the 1903 game law in 1908. It was this weird thing because there was going to be a period between the legislature wasn't going to come together until – the early portion of 1908, and the question was, oh, no, the law is going to expire in 1907. So there was this great impetus then in that year to try and get it all together and try and make sure that the legislature was, con legislature was concerned with it and perpetuate it, and it does. Mm -hmm. um, and so we began to have closed seasons then in that first decade of the 20th century. One of the things that's, um, you know, you, you teach U.S. history, you teach Texas history, you, you taught uh, – British history, you've taught, uh, you know, all, all over the place. But, you know, I always think of, you know, early 20th century, the 1920 census that tells us we're more urban than we are rural. And that seems to be part of the story as well. I mean, when we're primarily a rural population, what, what hunting means in the 19th century and kind of how that's changing as we're urbanizing. I mean, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, what we see by the time we get to the 1880s already, of course, railroads change everything and mm -hmm. the movement of people and the speed with which it moves. We basically have three distinctions of hunters. We have pot hunters or, or people who just basically kill it for food. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously not for survival. In most cases, they had domesticated animals. But it was a way of you know bringing meat and protein in. In most cases, they weren't preserving it. They were just eating it then. You have pot hunters, you have sport hunters, which we talked about their emergence in the 20s and 30s of the 19th century. Uh, and, and, and then you have mar market hunters. And by the time we get to the 20th century, particularly the Lacey Act of 1900, which made the transportation of illegal game illegal if you crossed state lines, this was a way of trying to curtail a lot of that kind of, uh, of behavior. Um, so you've got laws that cut strongly at market hunting. So that begins to eliminate. So then you're just left with the sport hunters and the pot hunters. Mm -hmm. And the question, of course, of access, if you've got people who are increasingly becoming urbanized and then you have a limited amount of habitat for wildlife. And then, of course, Texas is unique. Depending upon the number you check, it's either 97 or 98% privately owned versus places like Nevada, where the seem like the vast amount of it yeah. is actually owned by state or federal government, or even Alaska, or places like that. So Texas is going to have this kind of sport hunting culture that is already present from the 1850s. But the people who can, can participate in it are going to get smaller and smaller as we become more and more urbanized. 
and fewer and fewer people own large enough tracts of, if you will, of land to sustain habitat. Mm. So the sub- now some animals prosper. Mm-hmm. White-tailed deer have done very well yeah. with the help of conservation and Texas Parks and Wildlife's commitment to encouraging uh, private landowners, particularly of course, to to you know manage their land well for it. Uh, but also they adapt well to eating people's rose bushes. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, but some animals have it. Uh, some animals have, have just about disappeared, and so that gives hunting populations, a, a few, a people, fewer and fewer, I would say, um, access points. Uh, mm-hmm. And so an increasing urban population. Texas has, what, some of the leading growing cities in the United States right yeah. now? San Antonio and Austin, and that's just gobbling up territory. Yeah. Add to that a kind of monoculture, agriculture, does not generally aid and abet the, 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 you know, the, the growing of populations mm-hmm. of, of animals. So got a lot of things that have limited the opportunities for people to go hunting Mm -hmm. besides quite simply a culture that doesn't necessarily embrace it across the board yeah and of course that's changed too right i mean i mean i'd like to talk about that in a little bit just how views have changed with regard to hunting but one thing i want to ask before we get too far from the 19th century one of the dynamics i know you've looked at in your work is race uh and hunting right and i think of of you know those that need to hunt uh in the end of the 19th century is tenant farmers and sharecroppers and it's not about sport hunting it's about supplementing diet and getting some protein on the table but but i also know jim crow's at play and so how is that playing out with hunting so this was a means of of adding meat to your to your table Mm -hmm. right so if you were a sharecropper or a tenant farmer most of course uh, former slaves were sharecroppers they Mm -hmm. They weren't tenant farmers. Mm-hmm. They, all, they had nothing uh, other than their labor, their energy. And so that meant that in most cases, you know, they may have be able to have a little garden, some corn, something like that, right, to grow and eat for themselves. But hunting was an opportunity to add protein to the diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and they consume, like a lot of Texans, things that we wouldn't necessarily consume today. Raccoon, that's good stuff. Mm-hmm. And other types of animals, um, armadillos and and possum. So there was a lot of food stuffs that were out there that could be acquired. Now, for the landowners, this was a problem. Yeah. Because as a sharecropping contractual arrangement, the landowner benefited from a good yield on the property. Yeah. That meant they needed their tenants, their sharecroppers, to work and work hard. The more and the better yield that they received at the end of the year, then that meant more money in their pocket. This is where we begin to see game laws. So we began to see our first game laws in the 1870s, and it in particular is perceived by most historians as targeting the behavior of African-American sharecroppers and tenant farmers, and for that matter, even white tenant farmers, yeah. as a means of basically saying, hey, look, you need to be busy, not off in the woods chasing stuff and having mm-hmm. a good time at night, uh, chasing coons or during the day going hunting go work in the fields. Mm-hmm. And it was very much, if not race oriented, it was definitely one could argue economically oriented. Um, and those are our first real kind of attempts to cut down, like even on killing songbirds, because that was a fairly easy target and was palatable. 1870s, mm-hmm. that's where our first game was in Texas, uh-huh. particularly go. I think that's really interesting. I mean, to think about the roots, I mean, as these game laws have evolved over time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> where the roots of them lie and I think that's really interesting to know it was in that in that period and you know a class issue and a race issue of who's taking game you know it does seem like a lot of species are resilient you know whitetail seems really resilient but like quail I mean just how difficult it's been for some of these populations to get traction right um, after they were depleted uh, I've loved quail hunting um uh, uh, I've I've hunted pen raised quail and I've hunted wild quail. Pen raised quail are kind of sad because they kind of want to come to you and yeah. eat. But uh, <laughs> but when do we see kind of quail populations really kind of crash in this area? Well, they were already showing effects in the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. In fact, some of the first restrictions were on places like Galveston Island, where I believe it was 1891. Off the top of my head, I could be wrong on this. That they got a law passed locally that there was a restriction on hunting quail on Galveston Island, because already the numbers are beginning to drop. Quail are, as you know, they they need like this perfect environment. Mm -hmm. They need a little grassland. 
right? They need the edge, right? The thickets where they can hide, and then they need timber as well. And if you eliminate any of that habitat equation, you're putting them at risk. And besides that, uh, ground nesting birds are always targets now. Um, and so, I remember as a young, as a child in the early 1970s, listening to Bob White Quail, mm-hmm. and I remember coming back to Texas and they were gone. Yeah. At least East Texas in, the, in this region. Uh, you can find them obviously in South Texas. Like, I believe that this was not one I can say that I'm I'm really up on, but it's by the 1960s and 70s we really begin to see changes in quail populations, and most importantly, it seems to be in habitat. Mm-hmm. Again, ex- ex- extension of suburban um, living. But more importantly, I think many have argued it has to do with these large farms, mechanized. And, I mean, where I live in Hill County, which is mm. appropriate, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I can literally look, and it's a flat place, man. <laughs> it's a flat. And I can look out and not see a single tree. I yeah. believe I saw a statistic one time that said that only 3% of Hill County has trees. Wow. If you think about that. And it's not that many of, uh, it's not a large population. Yeah. But what you have then are these large fields of cotton which is not good for much anything yeah. in the sense of wildlife habitat occasionally corn hardly ever soybeans and there's no edge and that quail just need that and so there's been a lot of debate about whether drought and do they need water for the fertility of the eggs and the is there a question of of um of fire ants having affected them as fire ants have spread i've seen a lot of studies and i've never seen anything definitive what it sounds like is all of these things affect, and by the 18, 1960s, 1970s, we're just it's it's a bad formula for mm-hmm. whale populations, at least in a good portion of Texas. I've heard them described before as kind of a barometer for yeah. kind of the health of a of a kind of an, a, a landscape, a proverbial so, canary in a coal mine. Yeah, exactly. So the the fact that they're not there is saying something about the conditions uh, of the environment. Yeah. So. Um, Talk about turkey a little bit. I mean, you, I mean, you talked about the the quick decline of turkey. Um, the, the, a little bit more of a comeback story there, but talk talk a little bit about the turkey population. The turkeys is is a story that unfortunately I, it, there's like an ellipsis at the end because mm-hmm. right now we're looking at across the particularly this, the southeast in Texas, turkey numbers are starting to decline, mm. um, and they've declined over the last several years. So. One, it's a success story because turkeys were very quickly eliminated. They're mm-hmm. fairly easy targets, let's yeah. be honest. And <laughs> and people would go out and kill them. Um, I was looking at count actually. I was there was a report in the San Antonio Herald from 1877, and they came back. Two men had gone out, and they came back with three bears, 67 deer, 219 turkeys, God. four geese, 46 ducks, and 30 quails. 1877. Now two men, two week hunt. That's what they came back with. Turkeys were fairly easy targets. Yeah. And so turkeys were something that, in particular, Texas and many other states had really focused on in the last 30 years. A lot of it has to do with uh, private support, money that's come in, uh-huh. federations and organizations that have supported it, much like, for instance, Ducks Unlimited had done with things like uh, with waterfowl and creation of, of marshlands and wetlands. So we see support for the turkey, the return of the turkey. But in particular, the eastern turkey, its numbers have kind of dropped off. But a lot of relocation of turkeys, movement of turkeys throughout um, the southeast in Texas in the last 30 years has brought a fairly decent return. Now, in Texas, we still limit our eastern turkeys to one turkey a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we still have Rio Grande turkeys in the western uh, in central Texas and then uh, the western counties and the – the uh, bag limit's fairly generous. I believe if the top of my head, it's uh, you can take four turkeys total in the course of a year, whether spring and fall. And so that's a fairly generous um, bag limit. And that's a demonstration of, again, the work of Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, but also private conservation groups and entities advocating relocating turkeys, encouraging breeding programs. Let's pick up on that thread of kind of a changing view of hunting over time, because I know this is something that that you've encountered in your work, and as you've looked at um, your oral history work, looked mm-hmm. at kind of generational hunters and that changing kind of shifting meaning of hunting, even within a family, let alone a kind of a societal view of hunting. But 
I mentioned your thoughts on that over time. Yeah, so a couple years back, I was uh, was privileged enough to get a fellowship to do some interviews for uh, the Institute for Oral History there at Baylor. And it, one of the things I did is I looked and I've identified families from different demographic areas uh, or, or categories, if you will, but I had multi-generational hunting. And the first thing was it was hard to find them. Mm. Uh, and secondly, it was interesting to see how they have experienced hunting. And then the big question was, was there going to be another generation? Yeah. So what we found is that there's there's been a shift. Um, there was a, a biologist by the name of Matt Cartmill. I believe he was the one who probably first um, coined the phrase the Bambi syndrome. And he identified it. And he, what he said was that the film Bambi, which was a rendition, but so very different than the book that had come out just after World War I by Salton, had been radically shifted in its narrative and its depiction as it was being worked on in the 1930s. And when it was issued in 1941, of course, depicted humans, but particularly the hunter, in a very negative light. Mm -hmm. um, and you never see the hunter in Bambi. Yeah. All you see is you hear the gunshots, ricochets, which, of course, imply uh, a kind of uh, inappropriate or bad behavior in the sense of shooting. The only animals you see killed are birds because we don't apparently mind that birds get killed. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's. There's a whole thing. One of them is called the Noah's Ark syndrome. The idea is we don't mind birds dying, we, and we don't mind reptiles getting smoked. Yeah. But but fuzzy things with big eyes we struggle with because if nothing else, they're a lot like us. Yeah. And they look like us. They act like us. They seem to demonstrate affection for their young. Those type of things bother us. They so seem to have souls. They do. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, do. Yeah. Um, it was William Hornady, uh, who's associated with conservation, who said, of course, for him, he said, the skin of the animal is the soul. He was in the taxidermy and museums and stuff. But this <laughs> idea, the external gives us these impressions that these things are not just living, but there's something beyond them much like us. And he's doing that in the early 1900s or saying that. So what we get is the argument is that you get this film and it's, it's not maybe it is both the causation, but it's also symptomatic mm -hmm. something going on. And that is what you get is a depiction of the hunter as a negative. You never see the hunter. You only see the effect. And that's scarier. It's like, you don't. Okay. Spoiler alert. You don't hey, listen. You, you gave him eighty <laughs> years to watch Bambi. All right, all right. Go watch Bambi. <laughs> you don't see Bambi's mom die, mm -hmm. but you get a crying Bambi crying, "Mama, mm -hmm. Mama." I mean, that's that just rips your heart out and stomps on it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, the Bambi effect or the Bambi syndrome was the argument that for an increasingly urbanized America and world, for that matter, because of the impact of Disney, the film became the new depiction of nature. So what you get is also Disney releasing it in the age before VHS. I know some people don't know what that is, but for VHS and before DVD or whatever streaming, it was released every seven years. Yeah. It's it's also, I'm just thinking to your point, it's in vivid color too Absolutely. when everything else is in black and white. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the only, you only see the effect of the hunter. You see the killing of the bird, you see the presumed killing of, of uh, Bambi's mother. You see fire first mm -hmm. at the campsite, and then that ravages the forest. Man has entered the forest. That's the bad news. Yeah. And then, of course, eventually Bam Bambi gets shot. He doesn't die. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> not just the deer, but all of the animals are going to be affected by the fire. Now, we also know is that they burn those forests occasionally. Probably wouldn't burn as bad. Anything. But you see the dog. And the dog is the symbol, the dark animal with flashing teeth that is the symbol of human domestication. Mm -hmm. And the argument was to Disney, you may have heard the story, was the critics were like, hang on, dude, American hunters aren't like this. Because you think about it, we've already got 50 years of conservation impulse, game laws, etc. It's 1941. Yeah. His response, they're German. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. He shuts it down. And therefore, afterwards, what we get is an increasing urban population, which you're alluding to, who have no real understanding of nature save that which they get in film and, if you will, in this kind of thing. So what we're getting is, in, in Texas in particular, decreasing opportunity to access game. There's only so much land that's available. 
And increasingly, we see that Texans have realized there's money to be made Mm -hmm. with high fence, et cetera. And that means it's going to cost you something. Mm -hmm. Add to that a decreasing familiarity with bows and arrows and firearms and increasing population. So now we've got all these issues that are there, and you don't have a population that easily can move into this sport, nor are they inclined to as their only experience of animal world is maybe the squirrel on campus Mm -hmm. and the dog that they got from the rescue, and that's all they know. And so to go out and kill or hunt, which is a problem because Texas Parks and Wildlife after the first decade, it wasn't that yet, but the Texas legislature begins to, uh, in 1907, 1908, fund conservation with license fees, initially Mm -hmm. with non-residents but eventually with residents. So Texas and many other states depends on that money coming in of people at least buying a license. And then, of course, all the other types of taxes that are ac- accumulated by buying sporting goods within the state, particularly as of late with the proposal that passed a couple of years ago. So fewer and fewer participants means fewer and fewer dollars, which means less and less money for increased yeah. conservation and all kinds of other programs. So what we, what I saw in the interviews was, and what I heard in the interviews was, people who post World War II, many times who weren't raised, reared, hunting, embraced it. This is our highest point of hunters in America, was particularly when the veterans came back from war, mm. for various reasons. Mm-hmm. And what I heard were stories talking about either veterans, as I remember interviewing one man, he was 92, came back from the war, and he'd never really hunted before, but he had access to in-laws to land. I interviewed another man, a businessman, whose father came back from the war, and he used to take him out on some family land toward the hill country. Mm -hmm. And he remembered sitting with his father and his father whipping up a rifle and with open sights, killing a deer with one shot at 200-something yards. And that was like his father was a freaking god. Yeah. But he was a veteran. This was his opportunity to be with his son. It was a mentoring moment. That same businessman was concerned because while he had his father's guns— and his grandfather had hunted as well, he had no grandchildren or children. He had daughters, and they hadn't shown interest in too late teen years. And he asked the question, his name was Frank, who are my guns going to go to? Yeah. And that was a bigger question. It was a bigger question, what, not where are my guns going to. It was where does this culture go Yeah. as we look at a smaller population. Now, 2020 brought a kind of a, a little boom, a spike. And people going back into the fields where families in particular could go out together because of, ironically, a lockdown. But how long will that last? It's a bit like a revival. You know, people mm-hmm. go to church for a while, but after a while, it's maybe not all that convenient. Yeah, I'm sad. Um, so I, I know you've done education. You've done stuff with Texas Park and Wildlife with young hunters. I, yes. mean, I mean, when you talk to young hunters, what's... What's the sort of thing that you you want to communicate? I mean, you're you're coming from a historian's perspective. I mean, you're also a hunter. You're also a landowner. But what's the sort of what's your pitch? What, what's the sort of thing you want them to know? I, I've got a little mantra, but the key thing I try and communicate to in is to love the thing you pursue. Mm-hmm. If you love that thing you pursue, there is going to be all of these other things that come with it. You're going to care about the animal. When you're not pursuing it, when you do pursue it in the act of hunting it, you're going to make some decisions that will will be ethical that you can live with. Um, Aldo Leopold, a great conservationist from the 1920s all the way then to his death and timely death in the late 1940s, argued about hunting ethics. And he said ethics is what you do when no one else is looking Mm. and what you don't do even when it's legal. Yeah, You can do it, it is legal to do it, but you choose not to do it, and no one's looking. And so if we can have a next generation love the thing they pursue, they will hopefully encourage its continuing existence mm-hmm. and its welfare as well as hopefully participating in this culture and passing it on. Love is a powerful thing. And if we can move it beyond just simply the enthusiasm of the hunt to not a passion for the hunt, but a passion for that thing, that animal, 
then there's a whole lot of other things that can go with it that I think can last the generation, can last longer. There's a word I'm thinking about as you're talking in stewardship. Yeah. It seems to be kind of part of what you're talking about. And if there's not a next generation of hunters, you know, who will steward yeah. you know, that? Yeah. And again, we, you can talk finances, you can talk economics, but if people really don't care and they're more concerned about raccoons getting in their trash and an increasing population, um, suburban population or deer that they accidentally hit on the road and causes them, you know, inconvenience and maybe some financial inconvenience. That's not the same thing as caring and loving those animals mm -hmm. and pursuing their good, which I know it sounds so bizarre, uh, but I'm one of the best explanations I've, you know, I've ever come across is in, in, in Leopold makes the argument. Um, but there was uh, in the book, I had one of the essays was written by a fellow by the name of, of Father Ted Vitale. And he used to be the head of philosophy department at St. Louis University. He's retired now. But he describes this passion for the thing that you hunt. And that passion, mm -hmm. that love for it makes you make the right decisions. And it's impossible to convey to people many times who haven't participated in that activity what that love is. How can you love something you're killing mm -hmm. or you want to kill? And the short answer is you can't convey that except by shared experience. And that love then will come hopefully not only convey that passion for for the thing to other people, but you'll also want to bring them in. Mm -hmm. You'll want to help them understand what you're feeling, what you're wanting, and they too may then become, I don't want to say entrapped in hunting, but <laughs> they can be, because there's more than just hunting hunters that matter. It's the people around them that are supportive, sure. that participate, who may not go out but embrace it, who support it in the voting booth, mm -hmm. but also consume it and do all those types of things. So, yeah, I hope... I hope that we can convey that love to the next generation. And unfortunately it takes a lot of energy to do that Yeah, and sacrifice by someone. Well, you know, I, I think bringing a history to it, I mean, uh, you know, the conversations that I'm in, the conversations that you're in, the, the things that we always bring is context, which, you know, I think, I think is extremely important. I mean, as you think about current hunting issues, how important is it that you can bring that context to them? Um, it, I mean, it's important. It, it's, uh, to the next generation is it, it, it's, it's hard to do it. I mean, in the classroom, I do try by the way. And, and then as you're talking to young people in the field, it's a whole lot easier if they're the ones out there who just participated in one of the Texas parks and wildlife youth hunts or something along those lines. It's just difficult, particularly when they're so I mean, for instance, when I could talk about firearms in my class, I'm talking about primitive firearms. The majority of the class doesn't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. When I have to introduce them to wildlife, uh, you know, this is what a deer is. This is what an armadillo is. Now, they've seen armadillos on the side of the road. But th there is, unfortunately, such a distance now, mm -hmm. an inexperience, unfortunately. Um, and I have to say that I was, well, I was raised within the culture myself, and I heard the stories at Christmas time when we visited about how they used to hunt and how my grandfather used to, to guide poachers and do that <laughs> stuff during the, the Great Depression. I didn't get those opportunities until mm -hmm. I was an adult, and it was only through the sacrifice and the generosity of others. Now, I lived in a different state, but nonetheless, who said, you can hunt on our land. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that making opportunities is, is difficult. Um, and being able to take people out and give them the opportunity is time consuming and requires resources. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a gigantic task mm -hmm. and it has to be done one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. You can't take someone to a museum, a class to a museum, as I used to take my, my young students and say, look at the art or look at this. Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing as experiencing sitting in a blind or sitting out of doors or going on a dove hunt on September 1st, which is yeah. a holy day in Texas. Oh, yeah. Um, and saying, don't point the muzzle there and relax. It's okay. And laughing like you're, you know, and enjoying that community. It takes a lot of effort. Now, I, don't, I, I, I respect those who are trying to do this, particularly on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you, Bracey, and you're being generous with your time, um, is as a landowner, so you also have land. Yeah. So just talk about your plot of land. And, you know, what you've kind of seen as far as 
the health of that land in this regard or maybe changes you've seen in, in, in your landscape there in Hill County? Yeah, so we uh, we moved here from Indiana some years ago, and we always had the dream. I should say my wife is from Alaska, so she's yeah. she's she knows wild places. She does in yeah. Texas. Texas is just not Alaska. She reminds me constantly. <laughs> so the idea of enjoying and uh, having an opportunity to take a small piece of land, which is all we have, but to in particular focus the use of that land or the, our goal for that land to be for wildlife management. And mm-hmm. Texas has incentives for this. Um, so obviously there are a lot of people call it the ag exemption. It's not an exemption. The tax people tell you it's an incentive, mm-hmm. um, but you can also work your land for wildlife management. Now you got to turn in a program every year and demonstrate you're doing this. I have no problems. I love it. Mine's generally 150 pages long. <laughs> You're no, writing a thesis every Not year. kidding. They <laughs> wait for it. They're like, oh, yeah, we've been waiting for you to turn yours in. Um, but it's been fun developing. It's also been discouraging. Mm. And and there's a lot of challenges. So I'll mm-hmm. give you some of the challenges. And so one, of course, is uh, unless you own a good portion of land, generally 100, 150, 200 acres at least, it's hard to really manage any population. Mm-hmm. Uh, what you can do is create a positive environment, shall we say, for those various types of of populations and you can target that we've created ponds we've had excavators out and created that so creating wetlands on our property um the drought right now is wreaking havoc on that but yeah. nonetheless it's been there for years and it's been a place but there's always the issue and of course texas is very much concerned about property ownership and the rights of property owners and so as a result of that it's very hard to get people on board with the focus on Let's manage for the sake of wildlife. Add to that, the movement of people out of the cities is mm-hmm. difficult. And so what we're seeing increasingly are large farms being subdivided into 10-acre ranchettes, yeah. which then, again, I won't begrudge people the, the right to do with their land as they wish, but which means a deer walks by and gets smoked during hunting season. Mm-hmm. And there's no place for uh, animals, for instance, to go to as a kind of a reserve. So the degradation, 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 de- decreasing, shall we say, of potential habitat is something that's changing. I see, for instance, in our own county, where people moving from Dallas down, people moving from Waco northward. Yeah. Um, so that's affecting. We've had green energy, which sounds very positive, but has made radical changes in the environment. So, for instance, we've had some 200 or so wind turbines placed within eyesight. So when I go out at night, rather than looking at the stars, I look at hundreds of blinking red lights. Now, they say that that won't affect waterfowl, but I'll tell you, I did not see that many ducks at all last year on my ponds. Now, a lot of people in the South didn't either. There were a lot of uh, climate issues that perhaps stalled a lot of the ducks in, in the Great Plains. Okay. But then again, we just had, and it's a proposal, I'll admit that I am not an advocate of it, uh, a proposal for several thousand acres in a nearby town, Penelope, mm-hmm. to be developed into a solar farm yeah. by people who actually the money's coming from overseas. Mm-hmm. And so that area will mean, no, okay, so not admittedly, tilling land is not the best thing for habitat, but nothing's going to live in a, under and solar, a solar panels. Farm, yeah. And a solar farm is supplying energy to Dallas-Fort Worth, so it's not even something that's being a benefit to the local people. There's money perhaps coming in through incentives, tax payments, et cetera. But what I'm seeing more and more is habitat disappearing. I see. So even within Hill County, near Abbott, for instance, there's a new solar farm. And while, yes, we might need to be moving perhaps, in arguments are on both sides, away from petroleum products, which themselves are not all that perhaps environmentally he- you know, uh, healthy, mm-hmm. this clearly is changing the habitat and what's left of Hill County for populations. When I came there some 10 years ago, I was told that there's a town to the north of us called Malone that the generation before had never seen white-tailed deer. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I ride the, the truck at night biting the dust every year with the biologist for our area, Kyle Melton, and do the deer count. And I'll tell you, Man, it's a good night if we see a deer in Hill County. Wow. McKinnon County is awesome. Yeah. But, I'm, but even now, we're going to see that likely habitat decrease even more. 
So I'm a little discouraged, and and, and um, which makes me even more active in some ways. Perhaps you know that can irritate some people, but I am concerned. We're mm-hmm. losing habitat. We're losing people who are interested in it, and there are a lot of powers, a lot of people, a lot of economic interests vying for that habitat. And unfortunately, animals don't have a lot of advocates. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, interesting. Um, I want to mention the book again, Scott Nimrod in the World, uh, Bracy Hill. And I, what's been cool is uh, you found an audience for the book. And so it's been out a little while, but I'm interested in the conversations you've had about it. I mean, and you've been on podcasts with many more downloads than the one you're listening <laughs> to. And I know you found kind of a, a population that's resonated with the work you do. There's obviously your students you're having impact on, but outside the university. what the, What has that been like? And I mean... What, is, what topics do people want to engage you in when you're out and having conversations about hunting? The book itself was it was a, a way to avoid writing a dissertation. So <laughs> it was a 10-year baby of mine. And it particularly explored, of course, not only the history of hunting, but the history of hunting in regards to, to, to religious perspectives. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a book full of perspectives. So I, I identified some 24 people and, and and worked with them to develop, some of them professionals, some of them academics, some of them athletes, as it's in mm-hmm. a sports and religion series, uh, some of them professionals that are not related to any of those kind of arenas, and just getting their thoughts and their, um, their, their thoughts about not only just the activity, as almost all of them are practitioners, although some are writing against it, but as practitioners – but also as people looking towards the future and mm-hmm. even the ethical elements of it. So it's a little bit different focus. It's not necessary. It's definitely not apologetic mm-hmm. upright. There's definitely on both sides arguments presented in the text, but from very different perspectives. So when I encounter people, they're intrigued by it. What they generally do is they, they latch on to an essay <laughs> or they latch on to, and it's that, that expression that resonates with them, maybe offends them and what they appreciate is sometimes they have to wade through the academies, depending upon the, the essay. Sometimes it's in very plain English, mm-hmm. and that's the thing that resonates with them. But most importantly, I, I think that people, when they read it and when they encounter it or when I'm on podcasts and I'm discussing it, is that they're fascinated that somebody else is thinking about this too. Yeah. And it's this sense of, hey, there there are other people like me who are – contemplating these issues who perhaps struggle with the ethical elements or maybe that they celebrate it, but they feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't celebrate it. Maybe, you know, maybe this is not something that is uh, appropriate for my religious or spiritual approach. Uh, And they feel marginalized. Yeah. And this gives them an opportunity to feel like they're part of a larger conversation. That's the most positive kind of reaction. And I've received it from people from all walks of life, which has been just just fantastic and was, again, a great diversion from my dissertation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and it's given me opportunities to travel around the United States and do some talks, um, to converse with people who do types of hunting that I don't do, yeah. uh, who have opportunities that I haven't had. And to talk to people, even a few, who are coming up as teens and 20-year-olds who haven't had the opportunities that I've had. Mm-hmm. And it's been fun. Um, emails and uh, sometimes encountering people at, at, at gatherings that, oh, really? And I'm like, I'm, I'm thrilled that you've even heard of it, you know, or that you heard me on that podcast. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just been fun. Uh, and it makes me hopeful every time I encounter those because those are individuals who are concerned about the future um, of both the sport, but most importantly, about generations to come and mm-hmm. perhaps a, a depth and a quality of life that can be there, not just hunting animals, but observing them and seeing the richness of a natural environment that's diverse. Well, and as you said, just having a passion and an affection uh, for wildlife, um, I, I can just, I can hear in your voice and I know the way you want to communicate it to others, particularly the next generation. Because they'll be the stewards of it. Absolutely. So, well, Bracy, anything else you want to make sure you got in? I know you you, you, what you said you're going to brush up on your notes. Anything else you want to make sure you get in? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I thank you for the opportunity to chat. That was great having you on. Thanks, Bracy. The brazzles and white coat. Ride hard, that'll make it by dawn.
Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.